Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome back to another Real Conversation where it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. PM, or Dr. Pippa Malgram. She is the founder of uh, DRPM, that is, uh, that is her group, her advisory group, and she's also the founder of H Robotics. Uh, she's done a lot of things, advised President George W. Bush, and she has plenty of opinions that have been accurate in uh, geopolitical space. That's, that's where I wanted to start, uh, Pippa, with, uh, you wrote an excellent book called Signals in 2015, and unlike a lot of pundits uh, who I'm not totally aware or aware of what their batting averages are, you actually have a gargantuan batting average, a huge batting average, as Trump would call it. Uh, you actually called Trump, and I, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity uh, right off the bat to, 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 to really talk a little bit about your book and how you think about the world geopolitically. Yeah, so uh, to just be clear, I called the financial crisis, sold my house, moved my family into rental accommodation, uh, <laughs> then the slowdown in China, and then Trump, Brexit, and now the return of inflation and the rise of defense spending, all of which I covered in the book. And the key thing is, you know, I worked in the financial markets a long time. I was the chief currency strategist for Bankers Trust, the deputy head of strategy for UBS. And what I find is that people in the financial markets, they love to go around literally blind in one eye. They will only look at things through a mathematical or data lens. Mm -hmm. And that means they miss a lot of what's going on. And if you open the other eye and you just use your common sense, you see things. Sometimes they're simple things. Like I've been saying, you know, you could see inflation coming through something called uh, shrinkflation, which is when you um, open your breakfast cereal in the morning and the box is the same size as ever, maybe bigger, but there's like less inside, but the <laughs> price is the same. So what you're finding is that the price per weight is rising. That's an early indicator of inflation. So my system, as it were, is literally I open both eyes and I look at the world in a very holistic way. That's, and, you, and you nail a lot of big things and a lot of non-holistic people, I guess, uh, miss. Can you start with Trump and how you, ca you consider the rise of Trump and why you actually thought that he had the chance uh, that you, you ultimately thought that he had? Totally. So what's fascinating is everywhere in the world we see this uh, populist uprising occurring and everywhere people think it's a local issue. So I happen to live in London and I said, listen, Brexit is coming and people were like, no. But it's because you can see the underlying forces, and it's really simple. The debt burden is so big, it can't be paid down. So it's stressing the social fabric and raising the question, why can't the ends meet? How come my wealth is being distributed to some other guy and not to me? Mm -hmm. That leads to a second question, which is, why are you in charge? Which <laughs> then leads to everybody saying, I want someone new, an anti-establishment candidate, and you see that that was Brexit, that is Trump, that's also Macron in France. It's almost any location in the world you can identify the anti-establishment movement. Uh, once you see it in this global way, it's when you look at it locally, you go, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, when you look at that, when you, you say, like, why is this person in charge? I think that's a, a great question. I mean, that's a very common sense question. And that's something that irritates people generationally. Uh, you know Neil Howe, our, our, our chief demographer. Uh, he has yeah. views on this. I wonder what you think in terms of that challenge to authority. Do you think there, there's a demographic reason for this? Do you think there's a, a, a certain sp uh, time and space that we're in right now that perpetuates that? You know, I, I love Neil's work, and I think his book, The Fourth Turning, is, a, is, a, is an absolute must-have book on your shelf. Everybody should reread it. But I don't think it's only demographics, because, for example, I recently gave a speech for a thousand U.S. farmers. And, you know, there's this argument that the only people who voted for Trump are the uneducated and the unemployed. Right. Well, these people are educated, they're employed, and what unifies them is not that they are Bible bashers, it's not that they are disgruntled Republicans, it's not that they're stupid or uneducated. What unites them is they hate Washington. Yep. And that is all, and frankly, these guys were a lot older, you know, all 70s, even older. Uh, so I'm not so sure it's just demographics. I think it's everybody is feeling the pain of an economy that's delivering two competing forces. One is the debt burden, which gives you a lack of jobs, lack of growth, and it kills your hope in the future. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting to get the other side. The solution our policymakers chose was to generate some inflation. And you put those two together and you only get two big outcomes. One is pain and the other is innovation. 
So uh, social unrest, protest, and innovation at the same time. Well, when you look at the, you, I think you've called it the populist tide, and, and you, can, you look at the big places that Trump goes to, I mean, he really goes to what you said. Like, if farmers don't like Washington, he criticizes Washington. And if most people don't like the media, he criticizes the media. What, what do you think is, um, or do you think that both, I guess Steve Bannon probably has a lot to say uh, about using both in terms of bashing, but do you think that that's really tapping into the zeitgeist of it all? The media and totally. Washington. Well, because both of them are the establishment. Exactly. So I've been describing Trump uh, as an uber of politics. And it's important to think this way. He is literally disrupting, displacing, disintermediating the traditional establishment power structures. So that includes the media. It also includes the fundraisers, right? Because there's yep. no need for them if you can win the presidency without them. Uh, the technocracy, like where I come from, the people who are normally hired into the senior jobs of the bureaucracy and expect to get big titles, they have all been told, you know what, we can run the government without you. Because, you know, when I joined the White House initially, I was a kid in 1983, in 84, uh, there were 57 people on the National Security Council. Today, <laughs> by last count, I think it's over 400. Wow. Now, do you really need 400 people? And that doesn't even include the National Economic Council, the Domestic Policy Council, the Homeland <laughs> Defense. Do you all reporting to the president and the vice president directly? The answer is it needs to be flattened and streamlined. So that establishment, they, of course, are outraged because they're like, what do you mean you can run the government without me? What? I'm, I'm the genius. You have to have me. And it's like, not so much, actually. Well, in that, in that regard, I mean, just the, the entire edifice of Washington, we just bought a, a Washington policy research team. And I mean, I, I, I can't believe it. I, I'm not a Republican, Democrat, I'm Canadian. That's what I say every time because it's true. Uh, but when I go there, I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, this is like a, it's like a terrible place to live and to work in terms of just being part of, of, of just the bureaucracy. And then I think about the other side of this, which is Europe. Now, Europe, which you have strong views on, I want to hear on next. I mean, if you think a Washington bureaucrat is bad, like, how about a Eurocrat? Like, people don't, oh, even, wow. people don't even know who they are. Yeah, and they're not elected. <laughs> <laughs> they're so, not famous. Yeah. They're just these people in Brussels. So first, I have to say that the views I'm going to give you are my own. And that's important <laughs> because I've formally become an advisor to the British government, which is not to say they always take my advice, but they put me in a position where I can give it uh, on Brexit. Right. Um, but yeah, so what's happening in on the continent is exactly what's happened in Britain and what's happened in America. There's a grassroots response and people are saying the system as it's structured is not serving me. I'll give you a really granular example. The morning that the Brexit vote came in, the markets start whacking the Italian banks, right? Not the British banks, it's the Italian banks. They go, <laughs> well, if Britain can go, maybe Italy can go, and then my positions are all wrong. This raises the question for the Italian politicians that uh, one of the banks in particular, I won't name, uh, they said, we got to have a bailout because it's such a structurally important institution. And the public heard this. They heard, we're going to find $5 billion to bail out a bank that's lost 98% of its share price, but we can't find five euros to deal with the 39% unemployment rate of the 25-year-olds and younger. Mm. And everybody goes, wait, what? This system is not working for me anymore. Right. And I think the same is true for Greece. As a small example, people are just saying, well, the adherence to the euro is costing a generation or two of human capital. Hmm. And, and not only that, but now there's a hole in the border in Greece because the Greeks literally can't afford to pay the border guards They've thrown open the illegal detention centers, uh, illegal immigration detention centers, because it's inhumane to keep them where there's nobody to feed them. And suddenly you have a, a hole in the border of Western Europe. And that's made the European leadership say, you know what? We used to say the EU and the euro were just one thing and they had to be held together. Now maybe there are two things and the EU must be protected at all costs, but the euro is badly constructed and now it's an actual existential risk to mm -hmm. the European Union. Now that now that's an explicit view. I love that view, and I and I just happen to agree with it. But if you look at if you look at the catalyst for that, and and you're you're very good at this. I mean, that's again, your book is called Signals. You're not just like creating noise. Um, you know, when you look at you got the Dutch election coming, then you have the French election in May. Uh, do you think that those are too obvious in terms of dominoes or, or catalysts? 
So maybe the best way to describe it is all of these European nations, and some people are not watching, like Austria, Sweden, Denmark, uh, they are all moving in the direction of a Brexit, mm -hmm. but they may not go all the way to the exit door. Right. So what they're moving toward is uh, they want a smaller state. They want more personal freedom, especially more entrepreneurial personal freedom, more ability to build a business yourself because you can't depend on the state because they're broke. Mm -hmm. And so I put it this way. When the French public starts saying the state is too large and we need more personal freedom for businesses, you're like, um, something big is happening here, really big. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And that's the Martine Le Pen vote, but it's also the Macron vote. And notice right. that Macron is a total independent. He has created an entirely new party for for uh, this election. So he's a bit like, again, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. They were the anti-establishment candidates. Macron is that person for France. So the French are moving this direction. I think the whole system's going to move this direction, too, in on, across Europe. How do you and actually, that? it's a good thing, probably. I, I mean, I'm not, I don't live in Europe, so it doesn't particularly like concern you know, my way of life, but it certainly will and, and has affected macro markets. Uh, if you look at uh, Germany's, what do you think Germany's going to do if you're right on this? So Germany is in a really awkward situation. Let me describe it this way. The, there's always a social contract. There's always a deal between the citizens and the state. You know, the citizens agree to abide by the law and they expect certain things from the state in exchange, like education to a certain level, a fire department, you know, a military, this kind of thing. The situation today is the social contract in Germany absolutely precludes the use of inflation as a means of dealing with the debt problem. Exactly. The social contract in the rest of Europe requires the use of inflation to deal with the debt problem. Mm -hmm. So this is at the heart of the matter. And as the inflation rate starts to pick up, which it is, now you can say it's only a tiny bit, but it doesn't matter. Symbolically, it is beginning to rip into the heart of the social contract question in Western Europe. Uh, and this is why now there's more discussion about, it's no longer impossible, I think the deputy chancellor said, to imagine uh, uh, a Europe that where a, a member of the euro actually departs, right? You actually hear them floating these ideas now because they realize that as it's structured, it's very fragile in the face of any inflation, mm -hmm. and yet also fragile in the face of no inflation. So right. either way, it's it's ill constructed. My personal view is anything they do that lifts the debt burden in any way is a buy story. So if they find ways to effectively reconfigure the debt problem, that would be good. But this rolling it into the future and yeah. thinking that someday the Greeks are going to pay, yeah, this is never going to happen. And well, it's worse I mean, for Italy. I mean, one way that they can, I mean, obviously the, the math is simple. One way to get rid of a debt burden, or at least in rate of change terms, reduce your debt burden, is to devalue your currency and create inflation. I mean, inflation can certainly reduce um, that debt problem. Why, why, I guess, I don't know if it's, it's why so much as when, you know, the euro's traded in a range of 10 cents, 105 to 115 for two years. It's like watching paint dry. Uh, so we got Eurocrats, bureaucrats, et cetera, but we watch, we watch this euro, if, could it potentially have a moment? I mean, to me, if you look at the history of the euro, obviously the mean reversion answer would be that the euro could go to 85 cents. Um, do you think that that is the answer, like to a degree? You always start with debt, so I think that that, to me, would be one of the answers. Well, and so everybody in Europe wants to do that except the Germans. And so, yeah, this is the conflict. If they could devalue, and of course it's trickier now because we have President Trump saying, don't even think about that, yeah. right? Like, don't even go there. So, uh, and the thing is, you can't engineer where currency goes. You know, you could try. I mean, again, you know, my career started working on the Plaza Agreement. And the fact is the dollar was already falling and then they make a big announcement that we want it to be weaker. So you kick it, kick it down a stair, it's already falling down, but that's not necessarily the situation here. So I don't know, the options are not so obvious or simple, but the problem remains massive. And you know, even the German banks are not in great financial condition, uh, let alone the non-German banks. So Europe is definitely, it, it's a hard one to trade, let's put it that way. And the geopolitical pressure now is really coming from grassroots that are saying, we want 
an entirely new leadership. So I don't think, for example, Angela Merkel is likely to win this next election. So everything you assumed about what they stand for yeah. won't be true. No, oh, that's really interesting too. I mean, why wouldn't it change? Everything else, for God's sakes, is changing. You know, on that front, like, how do you link defense? I, I'm very interested in uh, your defense spending view. Uh, in particular, when if you if you if you have an isolationist view or a breakup view, and everyone everyone for themselves, you know, how does defense spending play into this or you know this this ramp uh, in, in terms of that sector uh, that you're bullish on? Sure. So I've been arguing for a couple of years now that quantitative easing four is actually arriving in the form of defense spending. Okay. And it's happening for a number of reasons. Uh, and again, I explain this at great length in the book, but in short. Um, the Russians, I think, have a view that's been described by the deputy head of NATO as uh, an arc of steel, which is to build military capability from the Arctic through the Baltic, across the border of Western Europe. They've said they want a permanent naval presence in the Mediterranean, and now they're moving into both North Africa and the Black Sea. So, you know, from a U.S. point of view, we always talk about Ukraine, and now maybe a bit about Syria, but that's not how Russia sees things. They have a much more comprehensive grand strategy. And they feel that a military strategy is useful because they kind of feel under attack in the sense that, for example, the sanctions came in and immediately the price of food went through the roof. Now, the, Rus the, the Russians are paying roughly 50% of their income on food alone. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, their central bank says, there's no inflation whatsoever. But you're like, <laughs> what? And I, you know, you know, I have this big argument. There's a gap between stated inflation versus what's actually happening. But for Russians, you know, that's a huge issue, and that means they need access to resources. And I would point out that the price of an average-sized salmon in Norway is worth more than a barrel of oil these days mm. in a country that needs fish as their main protein source. Mm -hmm. So they're becoming more militarily aggressive in this sense, uh, and they see opportunities with the U.S. withdrawing and leaving places on the monopoly board open, why not go for it? You know, Libya is one example of that, where they've been holding military exercises recently. The Chinese are a slightly different case. Their view is um, they've got, you know, a billion people who are no longer competitive in the world economy. They have had so much, uh, again, off the record inflation, you know, so many price hikes for food, for rent, that they've asked, the workers are asking for massive wage hikes. So they've had a five-fold increase in wages in the last three years, and they're on track for another seven to 10% in 2017. They have literally priced themselves out of the market. And so this is why both Apple and Foxconn, who assemble all the Apple products, have said they're looking to build production facilities in the United States, mm -hmm. because the US is now competitive with China. Now in that environment, the Chinese have an existential problem. So they have two big solutions. One is this thing called One Belt, One Road, which is a massive global infrastructure project building bridges, roads, rail stations, airports, literally all over the world mm -hmm. in order to secure the assets they need to bring home to keep people stable, like food and protein. But it's also about increasing the ability to defend China's interests. And so they're investing heavily in military defense technology. So then overlay all that with Donald Trump saying everybody needs to pay their 2% in NATO and suddenly bang, you basically see defense spending going through the roof. And let's not forget, militaries are the employer of last resort when you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's always easy to make trouble abroad in order to distract domestic public opinion from troubles at home. So there are lots of incentives, but I, I think if you look at any chart of defense stocks, you will see something unbelievable happening. Yep. And we have to think about the consequences of that. No, I, don't. I mean, it also taps in, when you hear enough of it, I mean, I live in the US, obviously, and, and as, a, as I said, I'm Canadian. I have an American firm, I have American kids, I have an American wife. Uh, but, but, but the more I hear people talk about defense spending, the more you actually, it starts to feed into your patriotic spirit, even if you're not American. I mean, because um, you can win in, in, in almost any regard. Uh, and, and I wonder like how that fits. You, you talk about, you actually called it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you called it being a global patriot. Um, I personally love the idea of being a patriot. I'm always tweeting pictures of Braveheart for God's sakes. I mean, so, so, so what does that mean? And, and, and is that linked to, to this defense idea or everybody looking inward, but also looking at themselves as being, you know, the change itself? 
Yeah, well, I think it goes both directions. I mean, this is the philosophical question of our time is, are you a globalist or are you a patriot? And can you be a global patriot or a patriotic globalist? This is a really interesting <laughs> question. Uh, and so what we see are people going to the extremes. And so if you're really at the patriot end of the spectrum, uh, you're hardening borders, as an example. Now, yeah. personally, I'm in favor of the freest possible movement of human capital, goods, and capital across borders. Yep. We are in a period of history where there's a reaction against that because so many people felt left behind, which is really tragic and ironic because by any measure, if you look at the condition of the world today, we have greater longevity of life, we have higher incomes uh, than ever in history, but we left enough people behind by the policy choices that we made that we now have a backlash. So there it is, you can't make it go away. So on the other side, um, the globalists, you know, they're all arguing that we should, you know, have more freedom at these borders. Anyway, it's a fight that we're gonna have. And I don't think it's gonna go away for some time. And, and, and actually, to be honest, it's probably a fair fight. Like it's one the market has to really decide where is the appropriate place to draw the line between global versus domestic interests and who gets included? So one solution and the solution that I argue in the book is the only one that works. It's, it's not turning to Washington. It's not money printing. Uh, it's not lowering interest rates. It is that every one of us needs to actually go and build tomorrow's economy ourselves. I love it. And you have to do it because the state isn't going to be there to look after you. It doesn't have the resources to do so. Our longevity now is so incredible because they're not just 3D printing things. They're 3D printing us, yeah. right? My kneecap, my hip one day, you know, <laughs> replacing. I mean, heck, they're going to still going to just be able to replace your brain. I don't know. But the point is, you're going to live to your 100. Yeah. So you don't, your, all your pensions are underfunded. You haven't saved enough. Everybody goes back to work. The reentry of 50 year olds and above into the workforce is rising rapidly, which I actually think is a good thing. So the answer is we go build. And to be honest, yeah. that's exactly how we got out of all the debt problems from uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution. So you can end a debt period with growth, but you have to build. And that's why this whole grassroots movement to make the state smaller and give more oxygen to the entrepreneurial impetus, even though it comes potentially in an unattractive package if you don't like Trump, the message is one the markets like. Yeah, absolutely is. I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any secret. I'm not like Donald Trump's best buddy and you probably wouldn't care to be mine either. Uh, but it's absolutely inspiring. It's you, you do feel like a, a, a single shooter. And uh, I love your message because you're, Dr. Pippa, you're, 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 you're kind of like Gandhi. You know, it's like, be, it's, it's like be the change you want to see in the world. That's, that's a it. really be basic message. And yeah, well, that's the message. That's And there's no reason we can't do it. So, I think there's so much latent talent and ingenuity in the world economy. I, I love this example recently of this company called Andela, which um, is training computer coders in Nigeria. And Mark Zuckerberg is a big backer of it. It's out of Silicon Valley. And why? Because they found that the people in Bangalore were being too expensive. And Silicon Valley was certainly too expensive. So they go, oh, well, we're all going to Africa anyway for philanthropic reasons. Let's, let's teach some people to code. Well, it turns out they're brilliant at coding. And I'm like, you know what? It's not because they're in Nigeria. It's because they're everywhere. And if you did the same thing in Oklahoma, you'd find a ton of brilliant coders there as well, which is a wonderful thing that if we just deploy the resources, latent talent that can build tomorrow's economy is everywhere. Yeah, it's great. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, after everyone asking for a bailout and the government's help and the help of debt, you know, you get to this really simple answer, which is you can help yourself. It's, it's, it's great. I love your message. I love how you've, uh, we're looking forward to, you're going to, you're going to republish the paperback of your book, are you not? Yeah. So the paperback version comes out uh, in June. And uh, it's funny because when I launched the book, you know, and it's funny, I mean, I work for the president, I've been in this market for a long time, but all the publishers said, nobody's gonna care about economics. It's such a boring subject. And I'm like, everybody cares about economics, <laughs> but they want it in plain English, which is the way I do it. Um, not math, not numbers, they want English. Anyway, it became, I crowdfunded it. 
It became a big success, a four times international bestseller, and but not released in the U.S. Yeah. Because the U.S. publisher said the American audience doesn't care about what's going on in the world. Well, I deeply disagree. I give speeches in the States all the time. People love understanding the context and the fact that actually, if I have to name the one place on the planet that is the most dynamic economic location today, it's the Mexico, Texas, Midwest corridor. Yeah. That is where my clients, big institutional investors are chucking a ton of money. Forget the wall. They're like, we'll just cross it, right? We'll fly over it. We will do business because Mexico is the new China. Yeah. And so anyway, we're releasing it into the U.S. in the updated paperback version in June, and that'll be the first time it's really accessible to the U.S. market, except for the, the audio version that I recorded myself. Oh, <laughs> nice. We get to hear a little bit yeah. more of your voice. I love Audible, yeah. listening to books on tape. That's perfect. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much. I mean, it's great to, great to have an opportunity to speak with you, and we'll look forward to uh, that publication and everything else. We'll look forward to seeing you hopefully again on, on Hedge Eye TV. Definitely. Thank you. All right. Thanks.